Hi, I'm Rod Stryker, and we're going to take a few minutes to talk about bandhas. So it's helpful in, to understand really what bandhas are. It's first of all helpful to understand or see yoga as an energetic process. So one of the defining characteristics of the Hatha Yoga tradition is that the yogis recognize that the body was a vessel of energy. And by shaping and controlling or directing energy, we really can shape and affect the way we see the world. Whether we're looking to be more effective externally in the material world, or we're looking to have a more effective spiritual life uh, and spiritual practice, really prana or life force are, is really our greatest ally. In other words, the way we utilize and direct life force will determine the way we see things, the way we ultimately uh, are able to draw our own resources and move out into the world or move toward our spiritual life. Prana is this kind of bow that sets everything in motion. So shaping energy is really critical. Now, the way they saw asana was, a way, was primarily as a tool to loosen or break down the obstacles to energy flow. So think about that. One of the reasons that we feel better when we leave a yoga class, uh, one of the reasons we feel better is because there's more prana flowing through us at the end of class than there was before class started. But think of now Bandha as being another step in that process of becoming more masterful in the way you shape your energy. Because although I've loosened the way energy is flowing, I haven't necessarily begun to consolidate its flow. And that's really the heart of what Bandha practice is all about. The word Bandha usually gets translated as lock. It's not my favorite definition or translation of the term. There is a term in English that's really similar to the word Bandha, and that is the word bond or bind. And the word bond has a couple of meanings. One is you create a bond, which is a connection. If you and I have a bond, we have a connection. But the other meaning of the word is a binding, a way of almost creating restraint or bondage. And so bandha actually refers to both ideas. One, it's a linking to, a kind of tying or consolidating energy that you want to consolidate. Another is to consolidate, to create a kind of restraint or framework by which you can collect energy. So both to link, but also to collect. All right, so there's three major bandhas. One of them gets all of the attention in the press, I like to say, which is typically the one in the area around the pelvic floor called Mula Bandha. Mula means root, very simply put. The second is Uddiyana Bandha, and Ud means to lift up or to go into flight. This is the one where your abdomen is being lifted, and you've probably seen demonstrations of that, of yogis at the end of exhale, drawing the abdominal organs powerfully back in and up. This is a super energizing technique. And then the one that really perhaps is the most refined of all of them, and in many ways yet the most critical of all of them, is called Jalandhara Bandha. And that's involving something up in this area, something related to the thoracic and cervical spine where the collarbones are rising. Now sometimes you'll see yogis doing it this way, where the spine is tall, the jaw is more or less level, collarbones are elevated, and, but often we'll see in photographs the head dropping forward. The word jala means net or to catch. It also means water, but the idea here is that you are catching or collecting or stopping something. This is that restraining idea. The three bandhas together are called treta bandha. So in a way you have a fourth bandha. Now, in modern times, I've seen yogis talk about the hasta bandhas, where they're talking about bandhas in the hands or bandhas in the feet. I've never seen it in an ancient scripture, so this is kind of a modern invention. It's okay, but there is no reference to it in ancient scriptures that I've seen. Now, each of the bandhas have different functions. And traditionally, this great master, Krishmacharya, taught that we should master the bandhas from the top down. Unfortunately, a lot of yogis are actually learning the root lock but not developing the other ones. And if you think about bandhas as they're often described, which is the idea of like um, a kind of restraint system, like 
we dam uh, a river in which we can then develop and collect hydroelectric power. So the Bunda creates a restraint, and then we can channel the potential energy that it's holding back. So it's a really, it's an apt metaphor for Bunda. What you realize is that you could never really work with that energy until you create a restraint system or a wall. Until you create the dam, you can't actually really utilize the energy. So John Darabanda is the restraint system. In other words, whether the head is simply in line, so the neck and cer cervical spine, thoracic spine are in line, collarbones elevated, or the head's falling forward, I'm creating restraint in this area. Then the work I do in the bandhas below it can be effectively used. If you start to work with the bandhas below, say Uddiyana Bandha or Mula Bandha, and you haven't yet created restraint, you're going to have limited benefit. In fact, sometimes deleterious benefits, non-constructive benefits. Uh, the outcomes are non-constructive. So I was taught through Krishmacharya's lineage that John Dharabandha was the first one to develop. It requires more, perhaps, more subtlety, but the value of it is that as you develop John Dharabandha, a couple of things happen that are really meaningful. Number one is the mind gets quieter. This idea of lengthening the back of the neck and then later working with dropping the chin forward activates the vagus nerve, which, which creates more stillness in the mind. Now, when I generate, when I move down to Uddiyana Bandha, which is this great generator of life force, which works with the navel plexus and the navel center, where really your healing and your potency and your energy of self-nurturance is just waiting to get tapped, you now have a, an, away, uh, an ability to contain that energy. And finally, the Mula Bandha is this unique technique that helps to gather our senses, helps to gather and collect our senses instead of moving outward to move inward. But also what it does is it generates uh, activity where there's, we'll say mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually speaking, a lot of stagnation. We have, we have a tendency to be kind of very attentive to our worldly stuff and our body, not so attentive to spirituality. That's just how human beings are, that our default position is our body and the world. And so what Mula Bandha does is potentially shake that up a little bit. It breaks down that kind of uh, overly sense of being anchored or attached to our worldly existence. Now, just for a moment, though, think about this, because the bandhas should not be practiced by everyone all the time. If you have a tendency to be spacey, if you have a tendency toward um, irregularity in terms of elimination, if you are amenorrhea, so someone who has irregular menstrual cycles, doing too much malabunda can be counterproductive. Why? Because it's moving you toward less embodiment and it's moving prana upward where you need it actually to help you move downward, stay grounded, stay regular, and stay, uh, and stay embodied. So indeed, Mula Bandha is not necessarily helpful for everyone all the time. It should also, there's some contraindications. Pregnancy is one, certainly. Menstrual cycle is another. Women with IUDs should actually be careful with Mula Bandha. So there are definitely considerations about it. And ultimately, I would suggest that all, whatever, as you start to step into Bandha practice, it's really something that ideally you are being guided by a masterful teacher, someone who has a lot of experience and can help guide you through and determine the amount of Bandha that you should be doing. When Bandhas are done correctly and we are um, approaching them with a deeply relaxed state of mind. Maybe I should put that differently. You're approaching Bandha correctly when you're approaching the practice of Bandha with a calm and relaxed state of mind. One of the things that I tell my students who are teachers, I say, please don't teach it to people who can't breathe smoothly. So you first have to establish even smooth breathing, the ability to shape inhale or exhale elegantly and extend it. So that's preliminary to Bandha practice. 
The ability to remain in asana comfortably for an extended period of time so that you're overall becoming more and more an embodiment of stability and ease in your asana practice. If you have those two things established, and then there's not a lot of emotional turbulence in your life, then Bandha is one of the most significant ways to take your yoga from simply an asana practice to truly a yoga practice. So approach Bandhas methodically, mindfully, and with guidance, and they build your ability to tap into the true uh, power of yoga. Enjoy your bandhas.